Classes in War Game Design, a series of lectures based on George Philly's book, Designing Board War Games, Introduction, to be available from Smashwords.com and Amazon Kindle. And today, Lecture 8, the final lecture on Stalingrad. Today we discuss replacements, supply rules, and a few simple tactics. Welcome to the next lecture on gameplay in Stalingrad, and we'll discuss where we're going and what ought to be done as part of pushing ahead and understanding the game. The last two lectures discussed movement and combat. Before that, we discussed terrain. There are a number of other miscellaneous rules in the game some of which are fairly important, some of which are fairly minor, and what we're going to do is to finish things off by discussing the last few miscellaneous rules. An amusing miscellaneous rule arises because if you go to the southern end of the map board in the Crimea, there are the Kirch Straits, the Straits of Azov, And there's land on two adjoining squares, but the land is not connected. And for these two pieces of land, you have a sp some special rules. The first rule is that units of opposite sides can sit here and here, but are not allowed to attack each other. They just sit there. <coughs> to move across at this f feature, you move up to here in turn one. On turn two, you move here. And then on turn three, you may move on your way. So you can get troops across the straits, but it's slow. You, can all, you can, cannot run um, across if there's an enemy unit there. You can supply across the straits, it's a special feature, but movement across it is exceedingly slow. Coming back to the game, we've talked about movement, We've talked about combat. There are, however, a number of other features that appear in different games that refer to other issues within military science. Um, one of these falls under the description of reinforcements And replacements. The notion of reinforcements is that it's possibly the case that you're allowed to move additional unit counters onto the board that weren't there at the start of the game. For example, if you were refighting the Battle of Gettysburg, it might be that at the start of the game, there is the map, and there are no units on it anywhere to be seen. And the units appear on various highways and then march toward the town. And as time goes on, more and more units appear from some place. On the other hand, if we're staying with our Civil War description, if you have what were then called regiments, which were really what we would call battalions in size, it might be this case that as time goes on, each state on each side raises additional regiments and ships them off to the front. But if you're the commanding general and lucky, it could be the case that... Um, the governors of the various states or whoever raise individual soldiers and send them off to replace losses in units. From the game designer standpoint, um, the notion of replacements are we have had combat, there have been units removed from the map board, and instead of saying, gee, um, we will have new units coming on representing new units being produced, what we say is, we will reduce the size of the counter mix, we will reduce how many units we have to use by saying that units that were eliminated can be brought back and put into service again. And that to a certain extent is realistic because in practice it's quite difficult to completely wipe a unit out. Uh, it may be eliminated so it's no longer militarily effective, but then you drop it into the rear area, give it fresh drafts of troops and so on, and you can send it forward again. Um, some countries were better at this than others in World War II. 
The other point, of, however, of replacements is it means you don't have to print as many different unit counters. Uh, one of the homework problems is to say, here is Stalingrad, here are the replacement rules. Instead of the replacement rules, which, which we'll talk about in a minute, re replace the replacements with reinforcements, which are brand new units, and see how many units you would need, roughly speaking, if you stayed with the same types of units that you had before. Um, okay, the st for Stalingrad, the Germans get four defense factors per turn of replacements starting on turn two. And those replacements start in Warsaw and no place else. The replacements may be any units that have been eliminated except the Finnish units are never replaced. Once they're wiped out, they're off the map. That's it. But the Germans can pull up anything else they want. Armor, um, small Romanian units if they need something small and weak as they see fit. For the Russians, the Russians have three what are called replacement cities, namely Leningrad, Moscow, of course it's not called Leningrad anymore, it's St. Petersburg, and the city that was then called Stalingrad, which is now Volgograd. The cities have changed names in the last half, three quarters of a century. Um, the, each of these cities produces replacement factors for the Russian army, and the replacement rate depends on the turn. At the start, at the, on turn, um, one, the replacement rate is zero. In September of 41, the replacement rate goes to four per city. In December, the replacement rate goes to five. And if you push on until May 1942, the replacement rate goes to six. Now, the game was actually offered with two replacement rates. The other replacement rate that was offered was called 468. The other replacement rate gives the Russians substantially more troops to replace their losses. 468 between even moderately skilled players is not very balanced. That is, the um, forces that um, the Russians get are so large that the Germans can't win. There was some proposal, this was due to the great Stalingrad player Richard Sylvan, that a historical replacement rate is more like that, 46913. Under the, uh, this is a rate at which um, the Germans would have almost no chance worth calculating, let alone playing. Um, the reason that doesn't seem to work in the game is that there are a number of other points where the game does not duplicate historical reality. Uh, if you want it, if you put in those other features, that replacement rate might work. However, under tournament play, it's a 0456. And the replacements are just, you reach into, you have a stack of units that have been eliminated. You choose which units you want to bring back onto the board. And these are each in defense factors. So if the Russian controls all three cities and is at a replacement rate of six, six times three is 18, he could bring onto the board three, four, six, fours, or two, five, seven, fours, plus a two, three, six, or whatever and any defense factors that are not used are stored for future turns. That storage is much more important for the German player. The German armored units, which are central to actually advancing the game, are worth um, six or seven or eight defense factors. Uh, the only way the German can replace them is to save up defense factors for several turns and then bring the units on. Question? You can only take replacements from units that have been removed? That's correct. Okay. So if your entire army is on the board, you cannot bring on any replacements. 
as a practical matter, this is not does not happen very often, except very early in the game, perhaps for the German. If your entire army is on the board and healthy, can you still store defense factors for later? Yes, if your entire army manages to be on the board by turn four or turn two, you can still store defense factors. You aren't required to bring units back if you want to save defense factors. In fact, at one time, there were a couple of people who were advocating the tactic, I did not endorse this, that the Germans should save up defense factors and then bring on a large pulse of units all at once, as opposed to bringing units back as soon as they can be brought back. I, you did not hear me recommend this as a tactic, but it is a tactic that has been advocated by at least a few people. So that's, that's the general notion of replacement. One of the homework assignments for a week from now is to march out there. And having marched out there, what you are called upon to do is to play a Stalingrad game out at least a half dozen turns using the Zun Su module save all the ZTG files, and send me a zip file or something with all of the ZTG files so I can look at it. For our many viewers who are um, not in the room with me, uh, if you are looking for opponents, Con Sim World has a board for Stalingrad, and if you go there, you can probably find people who would be willing to play. You can also find a board, not always quite as active, on Board Game Geek. And if you do this and explain you've never played the game before, you will find opponents. I would suggest if you are playing against someone who has played before, you should probably start by taking the Germans and not be too upset when you don't do too well the first time. Uh, some people would prefer to take the Russians and watch all of the awful things that can be done to an inexperienced Russian player. It's a learning experience, don't worry about it. You're seeing from the standpoint of learning how to design games, this is like learning uh, being in the operating system design course, putting out your first operating system, and then notice you've forgotten a few minor technical details like input and output commands so there's no way to communicate with the software. Little details that you pick up after you've tried it. Okay, so that's the supply and replacement rule. Um, rather, that's the replacement and reinforcement rule. The other thing we're going to talk about now today are called supplies, and this is the general issue of logistics. And units that are not in supply could be said to be surrounded, or they could be said to be isolated. And because we have these various rules, a Stalingrad actually has four distinct supply and isolation rules, each slightly different in what they do. The simplest one refers to combat units. Here's a hexagon. There's a combat unit in it. And in order to be in supply, the combat unit has to be able to trace a line of supply to a supply source. For the Russians, the supply source is any square on the east edge of the map. For the Germans, the supply city source are three cities, namely Helsinki, Bucharest, and Warsaw. In order to be in supply, a unit must be able to trace a path from its location to the supply source. Now, the complication in tracing to the supply source is there are certain things you cannot trace through. 
you have to stay on the board rather than going off it. You can't trace it through water like the Gulf of Bothnia. You can't trace it through a neutral country. That's basically Turkey. And you cannot trace it through enemy zones of control or enemy units. And therefore, if our 236 is parked here, and out here a couple of squares out, are three German 444s in a triangle. Each of the six squares joining our 236 is in the zone of control of an enemy unit. And because it is in the zone of control of an enemy unit, G, the unit is isolated. The unit then has two complete turns. Cycle of one Russian and German, or one German and Russian turn, to come back into supply. So if I am the Russian player, and I have surrounded a stack of German 886s in May, that's, I have finished my turn, they're surrounded at the end of May, the Germans have all of the June move and all of the July move to um, get things back into supply. However, um, if, at the start, if after two complete turns, that is, the second Russian turn, um, the German units are still isolated, they're removed from the board. Ditto if the Germans supply, surround a Russian unit, and the Russians have two of their own moves to resupply their unit, and if they fail to do so, at the end of the next, at the start of the next German turn, the units are removed. There is an interesting complication on this because if it's a Russian surrounded unit, they're removed at the start of the German next German turn. Um, if you run out of months of the game, because the game ends after 24 turns, and there are Russian units that were surrounded two turns previously, they are not eliminated by isolation because the game ends first. Under some conditions, that can affect who wins the game. Okay, so having said that, that's isolation and supply for um, units. The unit cannot, cannot be supplied through an enemy zone of control, through a body of water, neutral countries, edge of the board. Um, you might ask, well, suppose there were a line of Russian units like this. What does that say about the supply? And the answer is nothing. There is a German zone of control here, whether there is a Russian unit on the square or not. Uh, this unit would still be out of supply, even if there were Russian units parked over here. Okay, that's um, supply for units. There's also supply, and the supply rules for cities. And there are three sorts of supply rules for cities. So, for example, here is the city of Leningrad. And someplace out here, there are a line of German zones of control and the Gulf of Bothnia and so forth. The city is surrounded. It's out of supply. After two turns, the city surrenders. Now, what does this mean, the city surrenders? The city surrenders, and any Russian units that are trapped inside this surround line are eliminated too. And so there are now no defenders. Now the significance of those other units being surrounded and going out is that if they were, even if they, the units have not been surrounded for two turns, if the city surrounded city surrenders, it takes all of the surrounded units, the units that are surrounded with it along with it. When the city surrenders, its possession changes, and the uh, Russian cannot in that turn use that city to bring on replacements. Also, the German will probably occupy it. So the first issue is if the city is surrounded and is out of supply after two turns, it surrenders. The second issue has a different definition of surrounded. And the different definition of surround is that the surround 
must be with zones of control. Surrounds based on um, edge of the board and such not do not count. So here is the city of Leningrad, and it has next to it a land square here, and two land squares here, and two water squares here, and a water square of the Gulf of Bothnia there. Now suppose I put down German units here, here, I've got to make this a bit, here, yeah that's okay. These two squares are in a German zone of control, these two squares are in a German zone of control, these two squares are in a German zone of control, and now we have surround with zones of control. If a city is surrounded with zones of control, it stops supplying replacement factors. That is, if, if we are in May 40, or June 42, the Russians are getting six replacement factors a turn for each of their three cities, but they get no replacement factors for Leningrad because it's surrounded by zones of control. In order to just get a simple surround to make Leningrad surrender, I don't need three German units. I just need two, one here, one here. These two water squares count as part of the surround to force the city to be starved out. However, while the city is being starved out, it still produces replacement factors. Note, incidentally, that when I said the three German units were in this pattern, there's a picture of this in the book, I was implicitly saying that the German zones of control include the water squares. There's, the zone of control penetrates onto areas where there's nothing but water. Historically, this reflect, would reflect, for example, the Germans put motor torpedo boats on Lake Ladoga in order to combat control of the lake and keep the Russians from shipping stuff across the lake. So we have this somewhat complicated set of rules for supply. There's one more rule for supply, though, Here's the city of Leningrad again with 236 defending it. And uh, after com German combat, there is a German um, infantry of 444 next to the city. The city is under attack. If the city is under attack, not only can you not um, have it create reinforcements perhaps, but you cannot bring in reinforcements in that city. If the city is simply surrounded close or tight, you, you can bring in reinforcement replacement units, I mean, in the city. The fact that the, city, the units are going to be isolated as soon as they come in doesn't mean they can, you can't bring them in. It's just you should be focused on how you're going to open a supply line to them or you will lose them when you lose the city. However, if you get units next to the city, the city um, cannot be used to bring in replacements. Also, if you <coughs> have done this to all of the replacement cities, three for the Ger Russians, one for the German, if you do this to all of the replacement cities, not only can you not use them to bring in replacements, but any stored replacement factors you have are removed from the map. Okay, so I have now largely covered the Stalingrad rules. And the Stalingrad rules, if you were watching, cover movement, combat, supply, replacements, There is a bit of chrome involving weather, since the weather in spring and fall was uncertain. Um, and so we have a set of rules. And now we've gone over that. And the point of going over these rules was to make supply the issue that if we're going to talk about more complicated rule sets, it makes sense for you to have played at least one game first. So when I talk about more complicated combat rules or more complicated movement rules 
or logistics or re more complicated replacements, you have some idea of what I'm talking about as opposed to my saying, we are now going to discuss all of the possible ways of gridding a map and we will grind through all of these different map grids and you have no idea what this has to do with play. So we've in fact done it the way I've just described it. So far so good? Okay. So having covered the Stalingrad rules, and if you didn't find this enough explanation, I have two other books, Stalingrad for Beginners and Stalingrad Replayed, both of which are much less than the sales tax on a physics book in terms of price. We're talking cheap, not exorbitant. Um, if you look through that, you will find how to play because the, net, the class assignment, as I said early on, is that people are going to line up pairwise and play a game. Or at least play a half dozen turns so you have some idea of what gameplay resembles. And I think that's rather important if you want to see how these rules fall together into a coherent system of play. I will, however, since I have a few minutes left, discuss a few issues relating to tactics and how the rules come together to describe the sorts of moves you might make that actually make sense. And the point of this is, it's very nice to say I've put together a set of rules, but you, to some extent you need to analyze your own game and figure out how it is going to be played and what will happen and see how it works. Um, this is easiest to do if you take a game that is similar to games you have already played. If you have a game similar to something you've already played, you can change this or you can change that or you can modify features. If you try to completely new combat system, it might at first be unclear what is going to happen. Uh, I am reminded many years ago of playing a set of miniatures rules um, in which the two sides lined up, and not particularly by plan because it turned out that way. It's a Napoleonics game, and one side shot up the central unit on the other side, and that unit routed. And this was after there had been an exchange of fire. And when a unit routes, runs away from the battlefield, which was standard in Napoleonic times, um, the um, units adjacent had to check to see if they were going to route too. And each time there was a route, the units adjacent to that got to roll, and one of the factors that made it more likely that a unit would run away is that it could see other units running away. And so about two turns in, one of the two armies decided to have an outbreak of common sense, and the whole thing fled for the rear all at once. And all we did is roll dice. Uh, it is possible that the game designer did not intend the game to turn out this way, but that's what we saw happening. And sometimes you design a game, and what happens when people who are reasonably good at analyzing games play it is not quite what you expected. So let me point out a few design features Let's do this with hexagons. And so we have Here are some Germans. I'm simply labeling the attack factor, the defense factor, and the movement factor of the two sides. And here is a defending Russian unit, a 7, 10, 4. And the combat, since the Germans are attacking, this would be 8, 16, 24, 28, 30 to 10, or 3 to 1. Well, that's a Romanian cavalry. And at 3 to 1, a third of the time the defender is wiped out. A third of the time both sides lose the same number of attack factors. The weaker side is eliminated, the stronger side must lose at least as many. And a third of the time the defender is simply driven back two squares. 
However, suppose there aren't any Russian units over here for a distance, and suppose the 226 started here. In that case, the 226 could have marched around in a circle and gotten to here. Now, from the standpoint of computing the combat odds, this doesn't matter. It's still a 30 to 10 or a 3 to 1. However, what, does the, what do the rules say about retreats through enemy zones of control or enemy units? Mm -hmm. They're not allowed, right? And because they're not allowed, this unit cannot retreat here, occupied by Germans, here, occupied by Germans, here, occupied by Germans, here, enemy zone of control, here, enemy zone of control, here, enemy zone of control, and suddenly, because the unit is surrounded and has no retreat, it will be eliminated two-thirds of the time at three to one, because those DBAC2 results both convert into DLM because, effectively because there's no retreat. Now we'll consider so here is a river line and here are some Russian units defending and for the sake of argument the Russian units are a pair of 464s and the Germans line up the strongest possible group of armored units on the other side. There are six strongest units, which are that. And the Germans attack. Now, if the Germans have not paid attention to the rules, what they do is to say, we are attacking at 24 plus 22 is 46, and this is a 24, so 46 to 24. How do we reduce 46 to 24? We take both numbers and divide by the weaker number, and we get something like, oh, 1.9 to 1. And since the defender is stronger, we truncate to one to one, and half of the time the Germans are going to lose, well, a third of the time the Germans are simply going to lose all of their force and get nothing out of it. So the German player looks at this, and since the German player is not a total idiot, uh, she, he concludes that attacking his opponent is not this way is not very clever, and he could do something else to make her life miserable. Namely, the two seven seven sixes are both replaced with four four fours. That's not necessary, but there's a thing called economy of force. And now he uses the rule that you are allowed to split attacks against a square. And in particular, he says he will take 8, 16, 24, 32, 36 combat factors and attack 1, 4, 6, 4 at 36 to 12 or 3 to 1. And at 3 to 1, there could be an exchange, so he'll lose 8 attack factors, but nothing terrible happens to the German army. It's never simply thrown back in disarray. It's never killed. Um, and the other 444 attacks the other 464 at, it's behind a river, so it's doubled on defense at 4 to 12 or 1 to 3. And at 1 to 3, two thirds of the time, the German gets an A back 2, and the Russian player gets to push the unit back two squares, which is fairly inconsequential. And the other third of the time, the German unit goes into the dead pile, it's been eliminated. And suddenly we converted, by splitting attacks this way, we converted a very unfavorable attack into two attacks, one of which is entirely favorable, and the other of which will only cost you on the average one-third times four, four-thirds of a defense factor, which is tolerable. So you have now seen the um, notion of splitting. However, Suppose we have a slightly craftier Russian player. And what she does is to put here not two four six fours, but two five seven fours. 
or 574 and the 576. Now the German has a problem. He doesn't want to attack this frontally at one-to-one -one if he can avoid it. So what he says is, we'll try splitting. However, in order to split and attack the 574, it's doubled at 3 to 1, he would need 3 times 14, or 42 attack factors, attacking the 57. And he would need a not one unit to attack the other 57. So one unit attacks the other 57. He now has only f 5 units with which to attack the first 574. And how many combat factors can he get into 5 units? 886, 886, 886, 776. That's the most powerful attack he can cram into five units. It's only worth 39 attack factors. This would be a 39 to 14. Now we reduce it by dividing both sides, both numbers, by the weaker of the two. And this becomes 39 or... Um, something like 2.7 to 1, which truncates to 2 to 1. The 2 to 1 is much less favorable than the 3 to 1, because at 2 to 1, one time in 6, the German attackers are simply eliminated. Another one time in 6, they're thrown back two squares, and the attack caught, uh, does not advance the German position at all. And so we have this interesting circumstance where if you look at this um, situation, um, G, we have shown another tactic, and the tactic is called 3 to 1 proofing. And the notion of 3 to 1 proofing is the Russian can attempt to arrange your defensive positions in such a way that the German can only attack them at very unfavorable odds. Fortunately for the German, the, the Russian cannot do this along the full length of the front. There are areas where, indubitably, the Russian defenders will not be doubled on defense, and the German can always attack at high odds. There will be areas where um, the rivers bend instead of are straight, and the Russians don't have enough really high-strength units to hold everything. But the net result is, gee, the Germans have these difficulties that the Russians can make for them. And this sort of numerical analysis is one of the keys to tactics. Uh, I see from the clock that I have run us out of time. We are therefore at an end today.